Often, wars don't just involve countries fighting one another on an international level. Sometimes, they lead to civil divide and infighting that rips a country in half. One of the best examples of this was France during World War II. The 1940 armistice with Nazi Germany saw the country divided between two political entities, both of which claimed to be the legitimate French government. In today's video, we're going to discuss these two French states, what they stood for, and why they hated one another so much. In July 1940, France signed an armistice with Nazi Germany following her total defeats in the trenches. This agreement ended the war, but it also brought an end to the Third Republic, the French state that had governed France and her colonies since 1870. As part of the armistice, a French World War I veteran named Marshal Philippe Benoni Omar Petain took the country's reins. He established an authoritative state based out of the city of Vichy, known as Vichy France. In this new government, the marshal had complete power. Every pre-existing administrative body, including parliament, were now puppets of Petain, who turned France into a quasi-police state. German soldiers occupied the northern half of the country, and two million Frenchmen were taken as prisoners of war. Not everyone accepted this new French state, however. The renowned French general Charles de Gaulle was in London when the armistice was signed. On June 18, 1940, he issued an appeal to the world and his countrymen known as the June 18 Appeal. Under this appeal, he declared this new French state illegitimate and claimed they were traitors to France. He encouraged those who were loyal to her to resist this new regime and take back control of their country. Most of France and her territory supported the new state of Vichy France, but some allied themselves to de Gaulle's cause. De Gaulle and his supporters created a government in exile in London that claimed to be the legitimate government of France, known as Free France or France Libre. This political entity continued to fight in the war alongside the Allies under the Free French forces. It also supported the resistance back in occupied France, known as the French forces of the interior. This political clash divided the French. Initially, few joined de Gaulle's Free France. By late July 1940, only 7,000 French soldiers rallied to de Gaulle's side in England. Alongside these forces, 3,600 sailors on 50 ships belonging to the French Navy joined Britain's Royal Navy, creating the core of the Free French Naval Forces. As for the colonies, only St. Helena and New Hebrides immediately joined de Gaulle, though by the end of August, Free France had gained significant support in French Equatorial Africa. However, most of France's military personnel initially supported Petain's Vichy France. When the armistice was signed, 75% of France's military forces in England requested to return to France to serve the new regime. Those already on the mainland defaulted to serving the new regime because they couldn't escape. Most of the French Navy also stayed loyal to Vichy France. The political conflict between Free France and Vichy France created division and hatred in the French people. There was no space for neutrality. Everyone had to pick a side, and these choices tore friends and families apart. Many were imprisoned for their beliefs, exiled or executed. At the core of this conflict was the question of each government's legitimacy and the values each supported. Let's break down each political entity's claim to power and what values rallied people to their side. First, we have Vichy France, the one-man state instituted after the Armistice of June 1940. By July 9, 1940, the French Parliament voted to abandon the Third Republic and give Marshal Philippe Petain complete control of the country. Petain used his extensive power to implement many new policies that served his agenda. Best summarized as work, family, fatherland, or travail, famille, patrie. In many ways, the Vichy government collaborated directly with the Nazis. Petain's regime saw the persecution of Jews and communists, many of whom were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. The way in which the Petain regime came into being earned most of the French people's support. Because this was a decision supported by parliamentary vote, 
most people saw Pétons as the new legitimate government. By default, this meant they viewed de Gaulle's government in exile as a usurper government. French Admiral René-Émile Godefroy summed this point of view up very well in June 1940. For us Frenchmen, the fact is that a government still exists in France, a government supported by a parliament established in non-occupied territory and which in consequence cannot be considered irregular or deposed. The establishment elsewhere of another government and all support for this other government would clearly be a rebellion. Another reason why the French people supported Pétain and his Nazi collaborationist government was that they didn't believe Britain could take on Germany. Many believed Britain would fall in a matter of weeks, so supporting de Gaulle's London-based government would only result in more grief for France. Surrendering was the lesser of two evils. But support for Vichy France went much deeper than political legitimacy. When France lost to Germany in eight short months of war, the French people were shocked and humiliated by this humbling defeat. They needed a scapegoat. As is often the case, marginalized groups took the blame. Since the Dreyfus Affair in the 1890s, animosities toward the Jewish people had been growing in France. Alongside the Jews, socialists and communists were blamed for the decline of French society. The Third Republic's libertarian ways were blamed for promoting these damaging political beliefs and making France weak. Pétain, a staunch conservative, promised to correct these weaknesses by bringing back France's traditional values, such as by prohibiting divorce and banning abortion. Pétain also censored the press and imprisoned critics of his regime. This authoritative approach turned France into a quasi-police Nazi collaborationist state, all in the name of saving France in her most dire hour. If France wants to remain a global and European power, if France wants to remain dignified in Europe, she has to go a war alongside Germany against the Bolsheviks, said Jacques Doriot, the leader of the French Popular Party and a Nazi collaborator. This was the sort of narrative Pétain and his supporters pushed. Pétain swore to save France and many Frenchmen believed him. Free France, on the other hand, stood against everything the Vichy government represented. Following the French defeat in May of 1940, General Charles de Gaulle appeared to his countrymen to rally against the Germans and rekindle their faith in the French Empire. On his June 18 appeal, he said, France is not alone. She is not alone. She has a great empire behind her. Together with the British Empire, she can form a bloc that controls the seas and continue the struggle. She may, like England, draw upon the limitless industrial resources of the United States. The next day, de Gaulle addressed the people in mainland France directly. According to him, France's government had fallen to the enemy and all French institutions had ceased to function. This made the Vichy government's actions illegitimate and it was the clear duty of every Frenchman to defend the Republic. This was the basis of Free France's claim to legitimacy as a government. The armistice with the Germans was illegal, and by signing it, the former French government was committing treason. To de Gaulle and his followers, Pétain's rise to power was nothing but a coup d'etat. Pétain's supporters were traitors to France. That was why Free France not only fought the Germans, but also the Vichy French forces. To the Free French, the Vichy French were just as bad as the Germans. There weren't any Germans in Lyon. The French police did everything and that made it especially frightening, said René Nodot, a resistance fighter tasked with rescuing French Jews. The authorities would turn up at people's homes and say, open up, police. They had people's addresses, they had lists of names. They took people straight away, just as they were. In light of this blatant breach of human rights and against Vichy French military brutality, the Free French made their opinion clear. The Vichyssois were as much the enemy as their German occupiers. Although most Frenchmen initially supported Pétain's regime, public opinion changed over the next few years. This was mostly due to Pétain's own policies, which grew more brutal as time went on. Immediately after coming into power, Vichy officials put anti-Semitic policies in place, removing Jews from civil service and seizing their property. When the Nazis demanded French collaboration in the Holocaust, 
the Vichy regime willingly arrested and deported over 75,000 French and foreign Jews. One of the worst anti-Semitic crimes was the Vel de Viv roundup in July 1942, when 13,000 Jews, including 4,000 children, were sent to Auschwitz. This atrocity and others like it heavily influenced the French public's opinion of the Vichy government. Hatred for their German occupiers also grew when, in November 1942, following the Allies landing in North Africa, the Germans invaded France and took over the southern, unoccupied part of the country. When it became clear that Germany was losing the war, and with living conditions in France getting more and more difficult, the public took an even stronger stance against the Vichy government. Following the liberation of France in 1944, de Gaulle's Free French Provisional Government of the French Republic took control of France. It took decades for the French to come to terms with their willing participation in the Holocaust, however. Even as late as 1980, historians regarded Vichy France as simply the lesser of two evils. Today, Vichy France is widely acknowledged as a willing Nazi collaborationist state. But what do you think? Which French state do you believe had a more legitimate claim to power, regardless of values? Do you think the Vichy Soi were just as bad as the Nazis, or were they just trying to save their country and what dignity it had left? Would you have joined de Gaulle or stayed on the mainland? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below, and if you have any cool anecdotal stories for ourselves and other viewers to read. As always guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.